Good morning. So good to see everyone. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'm Becky Baker, uh, Minister of Families here at uh, Evangel Heights United Methodist Church. And on behalf of Pastor Michelle, I want to um, welcome everyone here today, including those who have joined us on social media. It's so good to see everyone. If you notice today on the top of our bulletin, it said Children's Sabbath. We will be celebrating that next Sunday. It is, a, it is a, um, something that the uh, United Methodist Church has recognized for years, and here at Evangel Heights, we have never celebrated that. And so next week, we're going to do that. And you'll hear more about it. So you're welcome to look it up um, on the website so you can get a little more information on it. And so um, I just wanted to let you know that we've got something very special happening. And so we also have something special happening. We have our own Joe Emmerth speaking today. And so we're always looking forward to that. And so now, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence with thanksgiving and praise. We ask you, Lord, to come and speak through each and every one of us, that our hearts will be warmed by your presence, that we will hear something new, something important, something that changes our lives. So be with us now, Lord Jesus, and fill this place with your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Please join in singing, Come Thou Almighty King. The words are provided in your packet. And now let us come together in prayer to our Lord. Dear God, creator and sustainer of all things, with praise and thanksgiving, we bring our petitions and requests to you. We thank you that you hold the victory over sin and death in this world. We thank you for your redemptive work you've done in our lives. And we thank you for the freedom and the hope you bring. We ask for your continued healing of Jill and for those who have finished surgeries and who are going through chemo. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you will continue the healing process upon their bodies. Give them strength. 
and endurance. For those who are grieving, surround them with your loving comfort. There is much that is weighing heavy on our nation, in our world. There are days we are discouraged and anxious. However, your word says for us to stand our ground, and that's what we will do in the power of your name. The enemy has no control over us, and we bring your word of truth as our weapon against his schemes. We know that we do not fight alone, for you are constantly at work on behalf of your children, shielding, protecting, strengthening, exposing deeds of darkness, bringing to light what needs to be known, covering us from the cruel attacks we face even when we're unaware. We ask that you would give us wisdom and discernment to recognize the schemes of the enemy in our lives and to stand strong against his work. We ask that you would remind us to pray constantly for our brothers and sisters around the world who are being persecuted at this very time for their faith. Strengthen them, Lord. We ask that you would help your church to stay alert in a world that tries to make things seem right when they are wrong. Help us see the difference and not be silent. We ask that you would equip us to be the salt and the light, that we would be loving and gracious, yet unyielding to sin. We ask that you would help us to remember to put on our armor daily, for you give us all that we need to stand firm for each day. We thank you for reminding us in your word that the one who is in us is greater than the one who is in the world, and so we stand. We thank you for your truth, that no weapon formed against you will prosper, and that you tell us that our hope is always in you, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our inherited blessing, place of possession, and gift straight from your hand. We love you, Lord. We need you. We, as your people, stand together in your great and powerful name. And so we say together the prayer in which Jesus has taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Thank you, Tucker. It's great to have him here today. The Clears are down in Bristol at uh, Brother Carey's church, and they are ministering down there today. Um, would the children like to come forward, please? And those at home, draw near. We have a special message just for you. Miss Ava, are you gonna come up with me today? And any other kids, big or little? How are you today? Good. I'm thinking we should wave at all the kids at home. Tell them we miss them. What do you think? Let's wave at them. Yeah. Well, I brought this empty box today. What do you think we should do with it? We could make a beach inside it. We could make a beach inside it. Good idea. Or we could set it on its side and use it as a refrigerator. But the problem with that is we'd put food in there. It'd get really stinky. No. Yeah, it would be really, really messy. Well, maybe we could sit in it and make it a car. Too tiny? Yeah, we'd probably break it. And it doesn't have any wheels, so it wouldn't work very well, would it? Hmm. I know. It'd be a hat. No? <laughs> You're missing her eyes. <laughs> it is just not very stylish, now is it? No. Well, you know what? This box was made for a purpose. This box has a purpose. And it's only made for that purpose. It's made to store things, whether it's shoes or toys or a beach. Store some food in it and put it in the fridge. That's right, you could store it in the fridge. But this is made for a purpose. And did you know that God made you for a purpose too? Yeah. The Bible says in Jeremiah that God said, I have a purpose for you. Not to harm you, but to prosper. For you to grow into the person that is going to be part of his kingdom. Isn't that cool? And you have a purpose. I don't know what that purpose is yet, do you? No. No, we don't. Because God wants us to find our purpose, and when we find it, mm, perfect because it works. Everyone has a purpose. Isn't that awesome? Something that we're all to do for him. And with his power, we can do it. That's awesome, isn't it? Yeah? No. <laughs> she was going, well, I don't know. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the children. I pray, dear God, that they will continue to grow and learn and find out what that purpose is that you have for their life. And we thank you, Lord, that you gave us a purpose, one that will grow your kingdom, one that will pull us closer to you. It's wonderful, Lord, and I thank you for your plan for our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Good morning. Today's scripture reading is from Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 4 to 7. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, 
Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Stand if you are able for the reading of the gospel. Today's gospel reading is from the book of Daniel, chapter 6, verses 25 through 28. Then King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language in all the earth, May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I hope this works. Oh, wow, you get to hear me. <clears throat> Don't raise your hands, but how many of you would consider yourself part of a minority? Think about it. 
And that varies, you know, from place to place and from year to year. I'm a minority. I'm a married man. No, you know, we are in a minority. There are more single men than married men. I don't know if you knew that. And in some countries, like China, for instance, there are many more single men than married men because they had a policy for many years of killing or aborting females. So I'm a minority in that respect. If you think about it, you might be a minority and not even know it. But if I ask you to raise your hand, every one of you should have said, I am a minority. If for no other reason, you're here today. You're a minority. Back in 1950, if you remember that, and I'm looking around, yeah, you do. In 1950, one out of every four people in the United States was the member of a church. Well, you might think it was more than that, but you know, that's quite a few. 25% of the population, one out of four people, was a church member, went to church regularly, 1950. Well, here we are 70 years later. How many people in the United States go to church regularly? One out of eight. 50% drop in that time. Now, there are reasons not to go to church. You're, you might be sick. Uh, you might have uh, some emergency arise, but uh, only one out of eight people is a church member these days. Um, I was thinking as I was preparing this, I have a street where I live and there are, it's a small street, one block long, and on our side of the street there are six houses. Out of those six houses, two people, two houses go to church. Well, that's only one out of three. Well, that's better than one out of eight. But across the street, I don't think any do. So, we are a minority. Don't feel bad about that. I think that's kind of neat. All pollsters today consider you a church member if you attend church once a month. Now, I think I know all of you. I've not met Penny's friends, but I've seen them. And I think I know all of you, and you come more than once a month. So you are really super members. Back in the fourth century, and I don't think any of you were there then, back in the fourth century, the emperor of Rome, whose name was Constantine, decided that Christianity would be the religion of the empire, the Roman Empire. Now, if we want to go back to the fourth century, everyone was a Christian. Wow. Now, they were Christians for a good reason. If you weren't, you might be killed. And nowadays, it's just kind of the reverse. In some places, you're killed if you are a Christian. But Constantine made it the religion of the empire, and so everyone was a Christian. Well, from that point forward, from the fourth century to today, things have kind of frittered away. They've gone downhill. Christianity is not always the choice for people today. And when people think of Christians, what do they think? You don't have to answer me, but in your own mind, what do people think of Christians? Well, back when I was growing up in the 50s, I was born in 1947, but growing up in the 50s, uh, I know that Christians were basically portrayed, were thought of about what we were for. We were for serving people. We were for helping. We were for having families, being good neighbors. At least that's how I remember the 50s when I was growing up. Now today, 
What do people think of Christians? Usually it's what they're against, not what they're for. Christians are against abortion. There's nothing wrong with that, is there? I mean, I'm not a, a fan of that. Uh, they're against many things. And we've seen over the last 10, 20 years that uh, Christians have been labeled as hypocrites. How many church leaders do you know have left their churches because of sin, scandal? Kind of hypocritical. So Christians today are not viewed the same way they were viewed when I was a young boy. People might avoid you if you're a Christian. So we find that in today's world, in our culture, we are a minority. How do we live in a culture like that? when we are not the majority. That's why the first scripture today is important from Jeremiah. A little history lesson, it'll take about 30 seconds. There were two kingdoms, Israel and Judah. Israel was uh, taken captive by Assyria in 726 BC and Judah, the southern kingdom, was taken into captivity by Nebuchadnezzar. But did you realize that there were two conquests of Judah? Nebuchadnezzar came down to Judah and he took the cream of the crop. He took all the noted people, all the, the greats of Judah and took them back to Babylon. Then in six, uh, no, five, 86 BC, uh, when Judah didn't get the message, he came and destroyed the whole country, destroyed Jerusalem, tore down the temple, and took everyone into captivity. Well, that's a little history lesson, and it has something to do with what we're speaking about today. God's people were taken captive to Babylon. They were in a culture, in a country, where they were the minority. And they had leaders who told them, and you can read about it in Jeremiah 28 if you like, Hananiah was the leader of this group, keep away from these people. Let us have nothing to do with people in Babylon. Stay separate. Don't be involved with them. In the very next chapter, in chapter 29, we see what Jeremiah wrote to the people and was read today by Terry. Don't listen to them. This is the word of God. Go into the city. Plant gardens, build houses, have families. Pray for the city. Oh my, pray for Babylon? Babylon who would take them into captivity, who had destroyed their country, pray for Babylon? Well, there's no way of getting around it, is there? That's what God said to do. And why? Well, he answers that question. Pray for the city because in its prosperity, you too will prosper. Just in the last month, I've begun doing something in my prayer life that I have not done in 74 years. I am praying for my community, Mishawaka, precisely. I'm praying for my town. Now maybe some of you have made that a habit all your lives, but I confess it's new to me. I'm praying for my community. Not that God will strike them dead, that's not what I'm praying. I'm praying that the community will prosper and that all of its citizens would prosper and that there would be peace in our city. So I'm doing what Jeremiah wrote to the captives in Babylon. I'm praying for my city. This is not new because this is what God wanted his people to do from the very beginning. The first covenant he made with Abram when he called him out of the land of Ur 
and said, I'm going to show you a country where you and your descendants will live. And because of you, Abraham, because of you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. Wow. How long did that last? Not very long. Because we see that when Israel entered the land of Canaan, the promised land, they drove out the inhabitants, which was God's plan, and then they made war or fought wars with all of the surrounding countries and would have nothing to do with the other countries. And we find during the time of Jesus, in fact, the Jewish people would have nothing to do with other people. It's kind of hard to be a blessing to other countries when you have nothing to do with them. And yet, that idea persists even to today. Now, most of you have probably never heard of Rod Dreher. He's a religion writer, D-R-E-H-E-R, -E -E Rod Dreher. He wrote a very popular book in religious circles called The Benedict Option. If you've not read it, I can tell you very simply, he's gone back a couple of centuries, a couple of millennia, and he is encouraging Christians to separate themselves from the world, have nothing to do with the culture of today. And he calls it the Benedict Option because Benedict, a thousand years ago or more, started monasticism. Monasteries, convents, where the religious people of the day separated themselves from the countries in which they lived. Kind of hard to be a blessing, isn't it? When you have nothing to do with the people? I have had those tendencies in my life ever since I've been a Christian to kind of stand off from people who do not view things the same way I do. I know you're thinking, well, yeah, that's you, that's not me. Well, yes, it is me, that's who I'm talking about, me. I used to stand off and say, well, they're not Christian. Uh, mm, I'll be around my own people. You know, I'll go to all the church activities. I'll invite people over that uh, think like I do, worship like I do, and uh, that'll be great. Well, I was wrong. That's not how it's supposed to be. Now, lest you think I'm suggesting we conform ourselves to the world, I'm not. Because we're going to the second scripture that was read today in Daniel. You read King Darius, who was the king of the Medes, issuing an edict in which he amazingly praises God, the God of Daniel. This is not a Christian. This is not a man who have ever, has ever worshipped God. But you saw at the end that he said, because God saved him from the lions. Well, you know what that was about, don't you? Daniel was thrown in a lion's den. Do you know why? Because he was praying. What has that got to do with anything? Well, Daniel was very high up in the kingdom. In fact, he was one of three people under the king. And the other two had it in for him because he was different. He didn't worship the gods of the Medes and the Persians. He worshiped the true God, and they didn't like that. So they maneuvered the king into issuing an edict in which if anyone prayed to any god but theirs, he would be sacrificed to the lions. So we find that Daniel was scared and he conformed to that wish and never prayed again. Well, no, no, that's not the story. Daniel not only prayed, he went to his room, threw open the shutters and prayed out into the city where everyone could see him. Not very smart, was it? Because it got him thrown in the lion's den. And we know how that turned out. Very well for Daniel. Not very good for those who persecuted him. But we find that Daniel, 
even in the midst of a culture that did not worship God, did not follow God, in a culture and a community and an empire that really didn't like God, still stood by his faith. And what resulted from that? An edict in the whole kingdom that the God of Daniel is the true God. Oh my, you can't, well, I can't. I can't speak for you, but I can't read that passage and not think, wow. The middle of Babylon, a pagan kingdom, and the king is saying God is the only true God because of one man, Daniel, who remained faithful. Wow. So, how are we to live in a culture that does not honor God? Are we to be secretive? Afraid? Withdrawn? Okay, I want to I caution you right now. I'm not suggesting you go to work and start passing out pamphlets. Okay, that's not what I'm suggesting. Uh, I've had friends who have done that and they thought they were persecuted when their boss said, you can't do that. <laughs> well, no, that's just not wise and that's not necessary. In the prayer today, and in our pastor's sermons recently, you have heard the term salt and light. You're probably tired of that term, but there's no way of getting around it. That's what we're supposed to be. Now, we've all heard that described. We know what it is, what it's meant to do. What does salt do? Well, it preserves. If you go to the 24th chapter of Matthew in that gospel, you will find that there will, there will be such a time in the future that all life would be destroyed on the earth except that God wants to spare his people. So at some point in the future, if you live long enough, there will be such a terrible time that only you, you, will be the reason that all life is not destroyed. Makes you feel kind of special, doesn't it? That the fate of mankind rests with Christians. Now I'm gonna make another confession. I love salt. You know, those with high blood pressure don't eat it a lot. Uh, me, I salt everything. My wife is one day gonna throttle me. She said, I've salted that already. And I'm pouring it on. I cannot get enough salt. I love salt. Maybe some of you are that way. Good, we'll get together. But salt often makes things better. It does for me. My wife eats potato chips that are unsalted. I mean, you may as well eat sawdust. <laughs> but she likes the crunch and she doesn't like the salt, so they make those things. That's sacrilegious, I know, but they do. <laughs> when we get chips at a restaurant, you know, I pour the salt on. But she says, wait, let me get a handful of those. So, so salt, I love salt. So being told that I should be salt, boy, that resonates with me. But remember, salt is supposed to make things better. Now, too much salt is probably not a good thing. So you don't want to beat people over the head with you being salt, right? You don't want to go up with a big C and wear a cape. I'm a Christian. But people will see you. They will talk to you. They should know what you are. If you are no different from anyone else that they meet, if, you are no, if they cannot tell that there is any difference in you, maybe you want to up the salt intake a bit. Be a little saltier. Now light, light. Um, by being a light to the world, I want you to understand that all of us, don't take this personally, all of us are dim bulbs. 
The only light we can shine is the reflected light of Jesus Christ in our lives. We read in the Gospel of John that he is the light of the world. He's the light. And only in so far as people see Jesus in us will we be light. So there's no sense flicking that switch. You don't do it on your own. You have nothing in you. You're not radioactive. No, no. Only as you reflect Jesus Christ are you going to be the example that you should be. So despite what Rod Dreher says, that we need to separate ourselves from the world if we're going to remain strong Christians, I'm suggesting that, forget his book, we need to do something different. We need to be in this world, not of the world, but in the world, working with people, visiting with people, talking to people, being an example, being salt and light in this world, living in a world that does not honor God. But as Paul says, they will see your good works and praise God, even if they don't like you. I've mentioned it in my Sunday school, and I'll mention it to you. Uh, I was reading a comment by an atheist. Uh, I don't normally read atheist works, but I, I do like to know what other people are thinking. And he said, I don't believe in God, but I'm glad that other people do. Amazing. I'm glad that other people do because they do such good things because of their beliefs. I'm thinking, why are you still an atheist? It's amazing. So how do we live today? How then shall we live? a book written by Chuck Colson years ago. How then shall we live? Well, we should live faithfully in a world, in a culture that doesn't honor God, faithful to God. Making sure that our lives reflect God. Sometimes I'm a, I'm a dark spot, but it's because of weakness, it's certainly not because of intent. Let's intend to live life in a culture, in a land that doesn't even honor God in many respects. Let's be a minority that seasons this whole lump and live for God faithfully so that this world can be saved. It's not our part to save it. But we do have an obligation. God has sent us into the world. Read what he told the apostles at the end of Matthew. I send you into the world. Go and teach all people to observe all I have commanded you. No, we don't stand on the street corner and shout at people. We don't knock on doors, as some denominations do, but we do live our lives so that people will know we are different. Now, some of you are pretty different already, and uh, so am I. But I mean different that people will know that here's a person who is upright. Here's a person that I can trust. Here's a person who's a good neighbor, a good fellow worker, Somebody that I'm glad to know, even though he's got peculiar ways. Really, they may think that, even though they have peculiar thoughts. They're a good person. I hope my neighbors can say that of me, and your neighbors can say that of you. And that's how we live in a world today. Thank you, Joe. And now let us now take the time for our offering and tithes. Ushers, please come forward.
as a fire is meant for burning with a bright and warming flame, so the church is meant for mission, giving glory to God's name, not to preach our creeds or customs, but to build a bridge of care. We join hands across the nations, finding Heavenly Father, we thank you that you can satisfy our every desire and need. Your word says that we should give honor to you with the first fruits of our wealth. Accept our tithes and offerings as a gift of worship to you. Multiply what we give for the effective growth of your kingdom. May Christ dwell in our hearts through faith, so that we, being rooted and grounded in love, may have the strength to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. May we be filled with the fullness of our God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. And now for a missional moment. Um, really, actually, it's more announcement. Senior high youth, Today you are going to get the joy of watching an episode of The Chosen. So please make sure that you make it down. Randy? Yep. Sorry, I to steal the show. Okay, go for it. Okay. Go for it. All right. I see Santa Claus in the mists. <laughs>
put forward to the church by Mr. Phil Lang. Some of you might remember him. <clears throat> and so I'm kind of speaking on his part today, which that's something to try and speak on Phil's part. All right, so let's talk about this a little bit. Is anybody familiar with Operation Christmas Child? Okay, great. Um, for those of you who don't know it, it's an organization through Samaritan's Purse where they give out shoe boxes to be filled with toys, presents for kids that have been shipped. What's that? I'm sorry. Most people can hear me. I talk to you a lot. So I haven't had a problem talking loud, even with the mask on. Um, so they've been going since 1993. A couple of facts in here. Uh, and they have served, oh my gosh, I put my glasses on. 188 million boys and girls over since 1993. So now, let's talk about putting these boxes together. Becky, can you hold this for me? Yeah. Boys, let's see if you can do this with me. I tried this the other day, and I'm not sure I can do this again. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to fold it, turn it over a little bit, and we're going to fold, make the first fold right there. Okay? So try that. Fold it right there, right part there. Mark, how you doing, Are you okay? All right. <laughs> All right, so now, we're going to fold these things in. So fold the sides in a little bit. Okay? Right there. There's the way part. Okay? Let's make our top first, though. So let's move the top here. So slide up on it. Pull these down, pull this one down, and we're going to fold that over, and that's going to make our little top. So put yours over just a little bit. There you go. Try that. All right, so now, take this part here. You can use it. It's pretty good, isn't it? All right, now, flip that over. There you go, just like that. All right, Mark, you doing okay? No. No. <laughs> Put these two ends just like that. And pull them in. Good. Squeeze in like that. And then fold it around. Just like that. Got it? There you go. That's pretty good. Good. All right. Fold these in just like that. And then fold this around. Come around there. Pull this part. There you go. Figure out what age group you're going to buy from. Okay, that's one of the things. You've got to figure out what age group. And there are little brochures that will tell you all this stuff. I'll leave up at the back also. Then you fill the box with a, a nice little wild toy. And then you can put sandals, crayons, school supplies, anything that's not perishable. Leave out toothpaste and little war figurines or toys that are more, you know, not quite Christian. Then these boxes get shipped down to North Carolina. They all pull together from our region from there. Phil usually has about three or four semis full of these boxes that depart from Cincinnati every year. Okay? 
Big sponsors for this are Hobby Lobby. So again, if you have any questions or any problems, go to Hobby Lobby. They have a whole setup down there. As well as Chick-fil-A in Cincinnati is a big, proud sponsor of these as well. You fill the box, things that these kids would really love. Remember, this may be the only gift these people get for Christmas, okay? See these boys here, hard putting together boxes over here? Imagine if all they got is this one box filled with stuff for Christmas, the joy on their faces, and they would just light up with this, okay? 188 million boys and girls since 1993, okay? You can be a part of this. Now, it does cost you a little bit of money. They want a donation of about $9, and that's also in the brochures too, because that helps fuel and get this box to where it's going, okay? But $9 to light up a child's face. Okay? I don't know about you guys, but to me, hearing a kid laugh, seeing a kid smile, there's no better Christmas present I can have. Okay? Oh, by the way, I'm going to become a grandparent in about four months. So just want to throw that in there. And, and, and it's twins, too. So get this, twins for my first grandchild. So please pray for me. Okay, and that's, that, that's the other thing you want to do with these boxes. Once you fill these boxes, put the sticker on them. Take me to the Hobby Lobby. We'll also be collecting them. We'll be collecting them here. And then Phil, I'm gonna try and get him up here by November 4th. We're gonna try and bring these boxes back. So you hear a lot about this in the upcoming weeks. November 4th is our cutoff date to bring them here because they have to get down. And then Phil goes down. These all get shipped down the Wednesday before Thanksgiving get filed out so they get sent out before Christmas. So November 4th, yes. They are sent all over the world. I mean, countries all over the world. What they do from Charlotte is they put, they go through all the boxes, make sure they're kid appropriate and make sure there's appropriate things in them. They also pack scripture verses inside these boxes too. They pray over the boxes. They ship them out to all different countries all over the world. I mean, they go to South American countries, African countries, all over the world into impoverished areas. That This box makes a difference between a kid having a Christmas. It's a great way to spread the gospel, to spread the word to these kids too. And all, you, all it costs you is $9. Plus, try and put together a box. How are we doing, boys? Close. Mark, how'd you do on yours? When did you finish it for? Oh, Mark finished his. Good, nice. Matt, you got yours? Penny, good. Dennis, very nice, okay. Sorry guys, didn't mean to take up all my time, but please, if you have any questions, I'll be around today. I'm sorry I'm gonna miss a few Sundays, but I'll be around. Um, I'm gonna leave Matt and Doug also with the information too. We'll also leave pamphlets up there. And like I said, if you run into problems, you can go to the website, Operation Christmas Child, or you can go by Hobby Lobby and they have it down there, okay? You know, the funny thing about this whole thing, I had no idea that Becky was gonna talk about a box today. And guess what we did today? So we made our own boxes. So doesn't that just tie in beautifully? Thank you guys. Please join in singing, Come Thou Font of Every Blessing.
For the benediction, I'm going to tell you what we end every Sunday school with in our class. How many of you know it? There should be at least 15 hands come up. May the Lord watch between you and me while we are absent one from another. Amen. Thank you.